you're getting scammed by your favorite sports team. And it's going to cost the city $850 million in public money. That's over $7 billion in public money. And you're actually better off flying a plane over a city and dumping a billion dollars on the populace. In fact, we're all getting ripped off. Just take me, for example. As a Minneapolis resident, I effectively paid $412 for this stadium, which is owned by a guy worth over a billion dollars. And then the team had the nerve to tell me it was actually a good deal. And it was. For them. But this is actually pretty common across the country, especially as teams start rolling out more expensive and ambitious stadium projects. But sports weren't always like this, with billionaire owners demanding that the public pay for their new stadium, all while threatening to relocate the team if we don't. And in order to get out of this spiral, we have to understand why having a professional sports franchise in our city isn't actually any more valuable than building a new target. But first, it's important to note what our cities and states were like before they were dominated by multi-billion dollar sports franchises. Because before 1950, stadiums were basically all privately funded. The idea was that if you owned the team, then you were also responsible for paying for the place they were going to play. But then in 1951, everything changed. You see, the MLB commissioner at the time, Ford Frick, thought that, quote, teams were bringing in large amounts of revenue to their host cities from which the owners weren't able to profit off of. So he figured that host cities should start repaying their teams by helping owners build and maintain stadiums through public subsidies. The only problem is Frick's initial claim isn't true, but that hasn't stopped owners today from using the same logic to get taxpayers to pay billions of dollars for their stadium. Now, the immediate result of these comments by Frick was a stadium being built in Milwaukee. It was the first ballpark to be financed with public funds, even though the city didn't even have an MLB team yet. But upon its completion in 1953 and three weeks before the season started, the Boston Braves applied for permission to relocate and move to Milwaukee, becoming the Milwaukee Braves until 1965. And this one move by the Braves to abandon their founding city in favor of a shiny new publicly financed stadium thousands of miles away set off a chain reaction that even Ford Frick couldn't have predicted. That's because later the same decade, the Brooklyn Dodgers and the New York Giants moved across the country to California, where both teams would play in publicly funded stadiums. Stadiums. Most notably, the now San Francisco Giants, who had a brand new stadium built for them using millions in taxpayer dollars. And suddenly, it became common practice to lure a professional sports team to your city by promising to build them a brand new stadium using public money, no matter the cost. And this trend wasn't just reserved for baseball. In fact, between 1953 and 1970, 27 of the 30 new stadiums that were built in the US used public funding to the tune of $450 million, which caused people to grow weary of this notion that they were paying for the stadiums of rich sports team owners, especially since it wasn't clear that having a pro sports team in your city offset the millions of dollars in taxes that went into building the new stadium. So in 1986, Congress created a law to put a cap on how much money stadiums could use to fund themselves. This new law said that in order for a stadium to receive tax-free funding from the public, the state and local government would have to pay for at least 90% of the stadium, and any money that went to paying back that 90% couldn't come from stadium revenues. This meant that in order for a new stadium to be built with public money, lawmakers would have to first commit a lot of taxpayer dollars to a big construction project and then raise taxes in order to pay for it. Now, the idea was that any politician that did this would be committing certain career sabotage. But Congress didn't account for the one factor that would make this new law completely useless, how much fans love their teams. Politicians were willing to spend taxpayer money to finance new stadiums and raise taxes just to keep their teams. And this created a loophole that is still being exploited to this day, where teams can demand a city or state pay for a larger portion of their stadium while threatening to relocate if they don't. In fact, between 1987 and 1999, 55 stadiums or arenas were refurbished or built in the US, costing taxpayers $5 billion, a 1,000% increase compared to the two decades prior. And since 2000, things have really started to pick up, with close to 90 new stadiums being built or renovated at a cost of $43.1 billion to taxpayers. And that's not even counting the multi-billion dollar stadium projects that are being teased across the country, including the ones in Buffalo, Tennessee, and Chicago. Even though for decades now, politicians from Barack Obama to Donald Trump have talked about closing this loophole. So what happens next? Are we as taxpayers just going to be on the hook for funding more and more expensive stadium projects, or is there a way out of this death spiral? Well, luckily for us, it's not as hard as you might think. That's because while 70% of Americans identify as sports fans, 53% of them also oppose the idea of publicly funded stadiums. 
Meaning in a country where a president can't even get over 50% of the vote, a majority of people agree that we shouldn't be paying for billionaire stadiums. And the first step to getting there is realizing that losing a professional sports team in your city really isn't all that unpopular. And while that may seem like a ridiculous statement, there are virtually no examples in which an elected official has been voted out because their city's pro sports team got relocated. In fact, politicians can find themselves in much more trouble when they vote for massive subsidies or funding for a stadium project. For example, a state senator was recalled in Wisconsin after he voted to use tax money to fund the construction of Miller Park. Miami's mayor was recalled for giving the Marlins a $900 million stadium subsidy, and a Georgia County commissioner was voted out in a landslide after he gave the Braves $300 million in taxpayer money for their stadium. But if using public money really is so unpopular, why do politicians keep doing it? Well, remember when I said that 70% of Americans are sports fans? The majority of those people are rich old white guys who tend to have a lot of power in the cities where they live. There's actually a whole study about this impact and how these rich old white guys who are often also business owners in the community are some of the biggest advocates for keeping their teams in their city and building new stadiums. And if we know anything about American politics, it's that if you're rich, you can more easily get your way. But this still doesn't answer the question of why these politicians feel like they can get away with it. I mean, if funding a new stadium with taxpayer money really was that unpopular, then anyone who did it would never be elected again. Well, the truth is that these politicians have gotten really good at manipulating the story to the point where they actually believe their own lies. You see, when you hear any politician in your city or state talk about why they need to build a new stadium, you'll always hear the same three talking points. It's good for the local economy, it's good for jobs, and it's good for the culture of the city. In fact, these are literally the same three talking points New York Governor Kathy Hochul made when she advocated for the building of the Buffalo Bills new $1.5 billion stadium, of which more than $1 billion will be paid for by city and state taxpayers. In her address to the New York State Congress, the lifelong Bills fan mentioned how stadium construction will create 10,000 temporary new construction jobs, as well as claiming that the economic impact of the new stadium will cover more than 100% of the public's $1 billion contribution over the next 30 years. There's just one issue. None of that is true. But let's start with this idea that a new stadium, like the one being built in Buffalo, would bring in a bunch of new jobs. Now, on the surface, that is technically correct. But when you dig deeper into those jobs, you realize that they're only beneficial to the city of Buffalo if local residents are hired, and there's no guarantee that they will be. Beyond that, what happens when the stadium is completed in 2026? All of those 10,000 new construction jobs instantly disappear, and the jobs that are left are often minimum wage game day positions that are only needed eight or nine times per year. But to be fair, even the governor admitted that these jobs are temporary. Besides, the real benefit will be seen once the stadium is finished, Right? Well, that's what Governor Hochul claimed would happen in her state when she promised that the public's more than $1 billion contribution would be more than 100% paid back over the next 30 years. And this is a bold claim, so I wanted to make sure it was supported, which led me to this study funded by the Bill Zoner. In it, they estimate the team will average an estimated $793 million annually in their county over the next 30 years. But this study presents a false choice. Sure, it might be true that if given the option between a barren desert and this new Bills stadium, that the new stadium will generate more money. But that's not the choice most cities actually have. Now, to break out an economics term for a second, every city has to take the opportunity cost of funding a new stadium into account. Put simply, that's just deciding if the $1 billion in taxpayer money to fund a stadium would be better spent somewhere else, like on schools, bridges, or a community program. But even with that in mind, we still don't have all the correct information. Because the state of New York conducted their own study that found the bills actually only directly contribute $27 million per year to the city and state. And the bulk of that, $19.5 million, comes in the form of income taxes paid by coaches, players, and staff. Which means that over the next 30 years, if you take the $1 billion taxpayers have to pay for the stadium, which works out to about $33.3 million per year, and you subtract that from the $27 million in value that the team provides the city and state, then you're left with a net loss of $6 million every single year. And that doesn't even take into account what else that $1 billion could have been spent on in the community. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that the Bills shouldn't get a new stadium or that a new stadium wouldn't give the team or city a boost. But why does the public have to pay for it? I mean, we don't pay for other businesses to be built in our cities. 
businesses that actually provide long-term jobs and economic benefits. In fact, a study done on professional sports teams across the country showed that it would be more economically beneficial to a city to build a new target than it would be to have a pro sports franchise. Even in a city like Chicago, which has five professional sports teams, if you were to remove all of them tomorrow, there would only be a 1% drop in economic activity. That's because adding or removing sports teams doesn't actually generate any new economic activity. It just reallocates it from one area of the local economy to another. Let's use the bills again as our example. A 2016 study from the Brookings Institute found that, quote, any economic activity generated while attending a game will largely, if not entirely, be offset by reduced spending on other local leisure activities. And just think about that for a second. On an NFL Sunday in a city like Buffalo, people aren't out playing mini golf or grabbing lunch. They're either at the game or watching it at home. This effect was even seen at Super Bowl 50, where restaurant owners in San Francisco reported a quote 40 to 50% reduction in reservations and services. Meaning instead of bringing in additional customers to local businesses, professional sporting events drive them away, costing the local economy even more money. And at this point, it seems like there's nothing we can do. Billionaire sports team owners are just going to keep using taxpayers in their city and state as a piggy bank and we're just going to go along with it. But it doesn't have to be like that. I mean, sure, it's always going to be true that rich old white guys are going to want us to pay for their stuff. And without any new laws, which have already been attempted by both parties, we probably won't see a slowing down of public money going to private stadiums. But that doesn't mean there isn't anything we can do. For instance, in Boise, Idaho, citizens voted overwhelmingly in 2019 to approve a ballot measure that requires a majority of voters to approve stadium projects that use more than $5 million in public funds. That was 13 years after a similar vote was passed in Seattle, where 74% of citizens voted that any public money spent on professional sports would have to generate a higher return on investment than if it were invested in a 30-year US Treasury bond. And if our negative $6 million a year return in Buffalo teaches us anything, that's a pretty high bar. But regardless of what that threshold is, voters putting this decision back in their hands is encouraging. However, it might be too late for the city of Buffalo.